welcome best-selling author Brandon Sanderson. I'm sorry guys, I could make those fly really well last night. And tonight they're just not flying. They're the little card things. Did anyone come in costume? You're in co oh, you are in costume. All right, we'll give you one. Anyone else in costume? Look at this. This is great. Nice. You went with the ooh, and with a sphere. Uh, you guys ought to check this out. Um, I am so happy to be here, guys. Um, thank you for coming out to see me. What we're going to do is we're going to do my standard thing, right? I'm going to talk at you for a while, and then we'll do a Q&A, and then I'm going to read something. And I haven't quite decided what I'm going to read yet, but I'll find something to read to you, something, something that hasn't been published yet. Um, so, Words of Radiance. Um, it's been four years <laughs> since the first book. Well, three and a half. I am so, so sorry about that. I kind of had a little thing I was doing. It was called The Wheel of Time. Um, and it's, it's this bizarre thing to like actually hold these books in my hand. Um, because I started writing the first book when I was 15, right? Um, I started writing what was a thing called Dragon Steel. Um, a story about Dalinar, a guy whose brother um, with a king had died, and he couldn't decide if he should take over the kingdom or if he should let you know, his, his young nephew take over the kingdom. But his young nephew was not very good at being king. And this, this conflict of a, a kind of a, a good person trying to decide if he should take over a kingdom was a really interesting conflict for me. And it stuck with me for years and years and years. Um, and... Now actually being able to write books about him is super awesome. It's just incredible. Um, this book, the hardest words to write in this entire book were actually the three on the front. <coughs> because years ago, um, I sat down and I outlined the Stormlight Archive, ten books. And part of the goal of the Stormlight Archive was to have each book have a character as a theme where all the characters were going to be important to every book, but you would get a sequence of flashbacks from this character's viewpoint, and they would, what was happening to them in the flashbacks and in the modern day would shape the narrative and give us a, a, a heart, a soul for the book. This was one of my attempts. You know, I, I love epic fantasy. This was one of my attempts to take some of the things that sometimes in epic fantasy hold it back, or that I've seen great authors do um, things with the genre, but in some cases... They also have, you know, things that make the books start to, you, you've noticed this, um, that they, they, they sometimes wander. And my idea was I wanted each book to have a really strong theme, which would force me as a writer to make each book have a strong narrative. So we didn't run into this sort of books that sometimes happen. Um, and I don't want to speak ill of people like Robert Jordan because I can only do this because I've read Robert Jordan, right? I'm standing on the shoulders of a giant and saying, in some of those middle books, and I even heard interviews where he said, I think I would have done something different if I'd been able to do it, um, but do it over. And I say, well, I can do something different. And so I want each book to have a character theme. Um, and this, this book was going to be Shalon's book. Um, and I named all the books in my original right. You know, we have Shalon's book, we have um, all, all of these things, and this book was going to be called, you're already laughing, it's named after this book that Shalon has given at the end of the first book. Um, it represents, you know, scientific discovery. It's this book that can never be filled. It has blank pages, and every person is supposed to add their knowledge to it and increase mankind's knowledge. And it's called the Book of Endless Pages because it can never be filled. And so it's this great thing. And I was gonna, it was talking to my agent. I'm like, and yeah, and the book's going to be called Book of Endless Pages. <laughs> it was actually my editor. Yeah, I'm talking to my editor, and he laughed at me. Um, and he said, really? And I'm like, yeah, it's, it, it's great. Isn't that a great title? He's like, do you really want to have a target that big painted on your, your thousand page plus book, Brandon? And it was the first time, and you know, I, this title had been my title for years, and it's the first time I'm like, oh, that's actually kind of funny. <laughs> you get this weird thing as writers, right, where it becomes something to you, and you start to ignore all the other, you know, associations. My very first book, um, that I published. It was actually a sixth book that I wrote. Uh, you know it as Elantris. Well, when I was writing it, I was taking linguistic classes and developing this really cool linguistics for it that I was super excited about. And I was creating the aeons, which are the symbols in the books. And every name is going to be based off of an aeon. And, um, I, I designed one that I called Edo, um, which was going to be, um, you know, about the city and things like this. And I ended up calling the book uh, The Spirit of Edoness. 
which is actually written at Donis. <laughs> and those who know Greek mythology, um, as soon as I handed this to my test readers, they're like, your book's great, but what does it have to do with Greek mythology? And I said, Greek mythology? And you're like, yeah, Adonis. And I looked at my cover, my, my title page, and said, oh, this is a word. I actually made a word. Um, and, you know, I do this a lot accidentally in other languages, but Adonis is one that you know. Like, um, it's, it's actually a part of Greek mythology. I've done it in other languages, like um, Elend and Straf are both words in German, I've been told. I didn't know that. I was just looking for words that sounded good in German. And I guess I did a really good job of it um, because they're both words. So words of radiance, uh, as, as Book of Endless Pages, I had never been able to see that that really is kind of funny that an enormous book was going to be called the Book of Endless Pages. Um, and so I spent a while thinking and realized, yeah, I'm going to have to rename this book. Um, and I, you know, I can do that. I can rename a book, right? Oh my goodness, it was so hard. I spent months sending things to my editor and having him say, ah, oh, that doesn't really work, does it? And I'd be like, no, it doesn't really work. And he'd send something back to me and I'd say, no, that doesn't work either. He's like, yeah, that doesn't work either. And we spent forever coming up with these three simple little words. Um, and coincidentally, I didn't really get the ending until, or the title until I wrote the ending. And the things that were happening in the ending I finally had a light bulb moment, which is nice because sometimes as a writer, you know, you're really waiting for one of those light bulb moments and you're like, oh no, what happens if I don't get one? Um, Neil Gaiman described writing a book once. You've heard this if you listen to writing excuses. It's my favorite. You know, writing a book is sometimes like jumping out of a, um, an airplane with a ball of yarn and trying to knit a parachute before you hit. Um, and every time you work on a book, there's this little piece of you that's like, what if the magic doesn't come together this time? What if it doesn't manifest? What if things just don't fall, come together? Um, because even though I talk a lot about writing, even though I am a you know, self-styled expert on writing or whatever, and I have the podcast and things like this, um, and I, I mean, I teach writing at a university, um, even with all of that, there are parts of this process that are still magic to me, which is good. It's part of what keeps me writing. But what happens when a book comes together, I can describe after the fact how it happened for that one book, but there's a piece of me that says, no, I don't know how. Everything, I just like I really think that someone who is playing the piano and has practiced this majestic piece can really say at the end of it, performing it, saying, yeah, I know exactly how that happened. No, you don't. There's something magical about all that practice coming together and it working. And Every time I get one of these books and it does work, it feels so good still. Uh, it feels wonderful. Once in a while it doesn't work. Fortunately, those don't get published. Um, I've, got a, I've got a few of those that are still in the drawer somewhere waiting for the light bulb to strike. Um, but anyway, it's, it's thrilling to me. It's wonderful to me. I'm glad that you can read Words of Radiance or the Book of Endless Pages, which is um, not quite endless, but if you didn't hear, it is the longest book that my publisher can physically print. Because the, the, what happens with um, book pages is we fold them into things called signatures. They take one big sheet and they print a bunch of things on them and they fold it together and you can look at your book and they staple them or, or sew them in or glue them in in signatures, they call them. And we used every slot for a signature in the publisher's binding facilities in this book. They could actually, no more pages could be added. Um, and so, you, um, you're holding the longest by page count book that Tor Books has ever published. Um, and they are the largest publisher of science fiction and fantasy in the world, so <laughs> that's pretty awesome. Um, oh, you don't have to clap for that. Someone seems like, I'm going to clap. I'm, I'm not sure if I should clap. You can clap, though, for Michael Whalen's art. <laughs> These end pages, um, as I understand, now Michael Whalen's my favorite artist. I love his art. He's amazing. I got into reading science fiction and fantasy because I picked up this gorgeous book called Dragon's Bane. And I absolutely love that. And unknowing, I went and looked for other cool books, and I found uh, uh, Dragon Prince by Melanie Ron. And I'm like, this cover's awesome, too. And then the Anne McCaffrey books, these covers are awesome. And they're all done by the same guy. Um, and I didn't know the same person was doing the covers back then. But they, I, I soon realized that if Michael Whelan had a cover, then that's a book I probably wanted to read, because the publisher was willing to pay for a lot for the cover. And Michael Whelan's very hard to get these days as an illustrator. He doesn't do a lot. His fine art sells so well, he doesn't really need to do commercial work. He can do his fine art 
um, paintings. Um, but on this, he was, uh, did, did this piece of art. He was reading the book. He um, calls up the publisher and says, you know, I really feel that since it's Shallan's book, it make, doesn't make sense that we don't have a picture of Shallan in it. So I'm painting you an end page. <laughs> kind of in a, you don't get to choose, but you will pay me for this because I'm doing it. Um, and so he, he, he went and painted this extra page um, for us to stick in the front because he felt like there should be a picture of Shalon in the book. Um, with me not knowing, with nobody really knowing, and him just calling and saying, we're going to do this, so deal with it. So that's why you got these awesome end pages. The original um, intention was to have the same end pages um, that were in the first book through all the series. And now it looks like we've set a precedent. We're going to have to do something awesome every, every one. So happy accident. Um, let's go ahead and do uh, a Q&A. You guys go ahead and ask me the questions that you are just dying to hear. As you, if you can't tell, I will talk at length. Go ahead, right in the back. Will you hear anything about Aiden Alcyon throughout the series? You want one of these? You can come up and get it. Um, um, so, for those who aren't aware, um, all my books are connected. The epic fantasies are connected in some way or form. Um, they have continuing characters, the same characters that, you know, there's a character from Elantris that showed up in Way of Kings, and there's a character from, you know, anyway, it, it's, all, it's all interconnected. And so, yes, you will find out more about what this is or who this was. Um, as the, the series progresses, and there's a little bit about it in here. So, all right, who else has a question? All right, right here. Okay, one of the, one of the things that interested me about the, about this and the Way of Kings was the, how different, like, the setting was and the underwater field, the crustaceans, the hunts. What made you decide on that as opposed to the more typical forest areas in other Okay, so <coughs> why did I choose to do Way of Kings in this kind of bizarre setting instead of a more standard setting? Um, excellent question. Um, here you go. Nice matte swag, by the way. Oh, awesome. Okay, so I have this sort of thing. I love fantasy books, right? I grew up reading them. Um, I enjoy them a great deal. I still read them quite a bit. Um, Sci-fi fantasy is my thing. Um, but in the late 90s, I kind of felt like epic fantasy in particular hit a bit of a rut. Um, and I'm not talking about the established authors. They were doing awesome things like, you know, one of the things I love about The Wheel of Time is The Wheel of Time really evolves as a series as you read it. You know, it starts off as this quest fantasy, which was very classical, like the 80s fantasy, but by book four, it becomes something completely different. Um, and I feel like he moved as the genre moved. But in the late 90s, a lot of the new writers were either trying to be Robert Jordan as he'd been 10 years ago, or they were trying to be George R. R. Martin. Um, and they, instead of like really um, uh, blazing new grounds, and I, I don't blame the writers, I, I really blame you know, the industry um, only publishing that. I'm sure there were great writers <coughs> trying to do other things, but me as a right reader, I just felt fatigued. I'm like, this fantasy should be the most imaginative genre. It should be the genre of the most distinctive, the most different, the most amazing genre out there, because it is the only genre where you can literally do anything. Even science fiction has more bounds than fantasy does. Um, and yet, why are we always in the same worlds, with the same cultures, uh, with the same sort of stories happening? This should be the genre of the most imaginative stories possible. And so as a writer, one of my mandates to myself was, I want to try and push this boundary. Um, and I'm sure the next generation will push it even more, or will react against me. But I was reacting against what I read. And so with the, the Stormlight Archive, which is the series I developed, um, to be my kind of opus, right, um, was the one where I wanted to, I was, uh, when I was developing it, I wanted to push the boundaries of uh, fantasy cultures and settings as far as I felt that um, I wanted them to go. And so the reason it's there is because I wanted to do it that way. Now, not every book is going to be like that. For instance, um, Mistborn, as a kind of modernist take on the fantasy genre, needed to be slightly more normal of a, of a setting because I was trying to play off the idea of the hero having failed, which needs some of that basis, that foundation. Um, and so I did the whole ash and mist thing rather than changing the culture quite so dramatically. But you'll find me whenever I'm writing something, I wanna, I wanna go places I haven't been before. That's why we read fantasy, right? Go places we haven't been before. And so if every fantasy is going the same place, it gets kind of repetitive. All right, let's do, let's see, oh, with the hat. Well, 
future novels? Oh, good question. Will Lyft become a recurring character in future novels? Um, uh, Lyft is one of the characters which I have seeded to be a main character um, in, the, in a future novels. Um, and for those who don't know, um, the Stormlight Archive is two arcs of five. Uh, the first five book arc is basically about the characters we're dealing now. It's almost like its own series. Um, but I, I really like the idea of the form of a novel. Sorry if this gets boring to you. Um, I'm a professor, right? Um, so, but I love the form of the novel, and I like doing things with it, which is why um, I've got that big essay on Tor.com, if you, if you read that. But, um, the idea that I wrote Plotted Words of Radiance as a series of three books that I put together in one volume to force you to read a trilogy together, bound together. Um, and it actually, I plotted it exactly the same way as I would plot a trilogy. So when you read this book, you're getting a trilogy. But it goes beyond that, because as a writer, what you're doing is you take this, first you start with a sentence, right? And you want the sentence to have some sort of contrast in the sentence. You want it to be doing multiple things and have a contrast with itself. And then you build a paragraph. And a really good paragraph has a bit of a rise and fall to itself. You begin with something, and then you go, you dig into an idea, and then you come out of that idea. And you combine those paragraphs into scenes. And the scenes are, have a beginning, middle, end of their own art. And then you combine those scenes into chapters. And each chapter, when it works really well, has its own sculpted feel. And then the chapters come together for character arcs. And the character arcs come together for books. And then those books came together to be bound into what we call Words of Radiance, which is really three books bound as one. And then these become part of a five-book arc. And then those two five-book arcs become a mega arc for what I'm trying to do. And this is just me playing with this idea of how many brackets can I put in here and how can I make the scope work the way I want it to. Um, and so what you, what you end up with is hopefully something that feels very cool, even though you have to wait a long time between them because of this. Um, it takes a long time to write a trilogy, even though, I mean, and I really mean that. This is, this, I don't know if you know how long this book is, um, but it, um, each of those pieces in there is longer than most novels, um, each of the three. And then there's a short story collection stapled in there as well um, in the interlude. So um, uh, the back five will have different characters, though some of the characters from the first five will still show up. Um, and I'm seeding characters who will be important in the back five, um, in the front five. And, and Lyft, is in, Lyft is important. Yeah, that's um, awesome. Lyft is a, in my outline. She's one of those things that had her um, in my wiki. I have an internal wiki. You can't find it. Um, it's it's, it's uh, on my computers only, um, but there's these entries for characters that my assistants get to and they're like, who is this? You have this character being a main character and they haven't even showed up yet. I'm like, oh, let me tell you about them. Um, it's kind of fun. All right, so there's someone way back over here. Okay, dude in the beard, go ahead. Yeah, that's you. You can. Steelheart. Is Steelheart a magic system, or is it something more scientific? Honestly, Steelheart, um, you know, don't let the secret out, but it's a superhero novel. And I see superheroes as magic, not science. Um, my, I, love, I love comics. I love superheroes. Um, but Superman is, that's a magic, right? Even if you put a rationale to it, it's a magic. Um, and so in the back of my head, it is a magic system, but it's, um, it's hidden as a superhero dystopian mashup, which I should mention... Um, Barnes & Noble had an exclusive edition of Steelheart, so if you didn't pick up Steelheart, their edition has something that no other edition has in it, in the form of an annotated chapter by me, and they still have a few of the, um, that edition here, um, which is, is rare. A lot of them don't have any left, and they're on to the, the later printings that don't have the cool thing in it. So if you want to, if you like the idea of a dystopian superhero mashup, um, it's the, you know, the pitch on that is um, a world where there are no heroes, there are only supervillains, and it's about normal people fighting them. It's awesome. Um, you can pick that up. Um, anyway, thank you for letting me um, pitch my book, and if you want one of these, you can come on up. Um, and so, let's see, we've had all guys ask questions. Where are the ladies? All right, go ahead, ask your question. I miss Alcatraz. You miss Alcatraz. Yes. He, he's, is Alcatraz coming back? Alcatraz is coming back. Yes, I will write the ending. It's really weird. Like when I wrote the Alcatraz books, um, I wrote them to um, with a, with a cliffhanger at the end, specifically because I was trying to push the publisher to publish number five because they'd said they didn't want it. I'm like, well, I'll just have a horrible cliffhanger, and then they'll have to. And no, they just like published it and they actually added like a line to the end somewhere 
and, and it says, and the last book, this is the end. I'm like, no! Um, and so I actually went and bought those books back from the publisher. Um, and um, now I've resold them to Tor. Um, and so is Tor, Tor is re, yes, we can clap for that. Tor is pretty awesome. So Tor will be re-releasing the Alcatraz books, and my goal is to provide them the last um, Alcatraz book to, with that re-release. So I'll have to make room on my shelf? Yeah, you'll have to make room for one more Alcatraz book. Well, now, um, now they have to match. Same artwork. Yeah. Oh, that's right, you'll have to get them matching. Oh, no. Oh, no, maybe I need to get an edition done with really bad cover art to match the other ones that I saw on my website or something. I did not like the covers of those books. The first one was okay, and then they got kind of... Yeah, I'll just tell you, the character makes fun of his own covers and books. All right, so there you are. All right, let's do right back there, way in the back. Yes, you go ahead, guy. Does it mean anything different for me now that this is my own stuff rather than the Wheel of Time? Um, here's the weird thing, right? The Wheel of Time feels as much my own, even though probably it shouldn't, right? The Wheel of Time is Robert Jordan's. Uh, I'll be, let's be very frank on that, but those characters feel as much my own um, as, you know, as, as Dalinar does. Um, and the truth is, I knew Rand and Matt before I knew Dalinar, because I picked up the Wheel of Time in 1990, and I started writing Dragonsteel in 91. Um, and so I've, been th I've known those characters longer than I've known any of my own characters. Um, even Hoyd, who was there in that first one, um, it, it came after, Dal after, after the Wheel of Time. And so um, when I said yes to Harriet on the Wheel of Time, I did it, I mean, it was a fantastic opportunity, um, but I did it because this is something I legitimately want to be part of. Um, and I've talked before about some of the exciting things. Like for years, I've been playing with a um, teleportation-based magic system, like gateways, because I've, I had been reading the Wheel of Time books, and I'm like, this is where that magic could go. And I had it all sketched out in my notes and things like this. And then I had written, I can't ever do this. It is too similar to the Wheel of Time. And then the Wheel of Time, I was writing it. And I'd be like, well, here are my notes on how to manipulate this magic system because I spent years wanting to do this. Um, and, and these, like, you know, Perrin is, is like my high school friend, right? I, I was one of these nerdish, nerdy bookish people who were my friends, were my, my characters in the books. And yes, I wasn't that lonely. I did have real friends, but, you know, like, um, so does it feel different to me? No, it really doesn't. I mean, I'm really proud of this. I've been planning forever for this. So, you know, this is my baby. But um, I, you know, when I, when I was offered the Wheel of Time, one thing about it was that um, Harriet, when she, she gave it to me, doing, uh, finding someone to finish the Wheel of Time had been a dying request from Robert Jordan for her. She didn't grieve until she found someone to do it. And then she went and grieved for a year and left me basically on my own. Um, now, th when it came to editing, she then came in as an editor and had a very strong hand. And it was very important that she do that. But in the actual process of outlining the three books, writing the first one, and deciding on the plot archetypes and all these things, I did that basically just me and Robert Jordan's notes. Um, and... There was a, a large amount of ownership um, uh, that Harriet allowed me to take, even though, let's make very clear, the Wheel of Time is not mine, but the characters kind of are mine in the same way they're all of yours, if that makes any sense. So, no, that's a long answer, isn't it? Um, uh, but it, one question I get a lot, and this is kind of weird, I'm sorry if uh, there are non-Wheel of Time readers here and I'm waxing about the Wheel of Time, but... Um, Waxing eloquent, I guess. Well, maybe eloquent. Oh. Waxing ramblingy. Um, the um, people ask me, does it hurt to kill off characters? Does it hurt to have characters that you don't get to write about anymore? And usually my answer is no, right? Because I have built a plot arc for years when I'm writing a book where I know what risks that character is going to take, and I build into it then the um, the the consequences of those actions. And it's like they demand to be allowed to do this, and then there is um, a ramification. 
Um, and when I actually write it, yes, there's a sorrow to it, but at the same time, it's fulfilling what that character had wanted to do for years and who they are, if that makes any sense. And so they are then done, and I don't feel a need to write any more about them. Um, you know, I'm not going to mention any names, not give spoilers, but a lot of these characters, I'm like, no, I don't feel a need to write any more stories because I told the story that they needed to have told, and that feels awesome. The exception is uh, The Wheel of Time. Because in some ways, the Wheel of Time is the only one. Now, I made the decision that no more Wheel of Time books should be written. It really belongs to Harriet, but when Harriet, she actually asked me what she thought we should, I thought we should do, and I was very upfront with no more Wheel of Time should be done. Um, because Robert Jordan didn't want it to be done. Um, but the only ones that hurt are not being able to write more stories about some of those characters, because I don't feel their stories are completely told, and I don't feel that I can. So that is painful. Um, I feel it's good. I'm the, it's the pain of having lost Robert Jordan. Um, so it's not a good pain, but it's a necessary pain. Um, and it's a pain that I shouldn't relinquish by simply going and writing all these books. But that is a pain. Not being able to tell the stories of these characters that I really feel didn't quite get told. So you'll have to tell them all in your own heads. Um, but the, there's a weird answer to your question. If you want one of these cards, come on up. All right. Woo! A hand, the first hand was right there. What do I think of the, 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 the trend of anti-heroes with people like Joe Abercrombie when I am writing a lot more traditional heroes? We are having good people in my books. Some flawed good people, but at their heart, good people. Um, there you are. Um, I write books like I would want to read. And um, I actually am, am quite happy that everything is trending that way because it lets me do my thing and stand out a little bit more. Um, I, I appreciate a lot of these writers and what they're doing, but it is not what I want to do. Um, I like writing about people that every person I know, personally, it, I feel is fundamentally good. Um, now, I'm sure there are people out there who are not, but the people I know, the people I want to talk to, the people I want to spend time with, they may do some really bad things on occasion, but they are fundamentally good people. And that's the type of person I want to write a story about. Um, I want to write a story about someone, you know, most people, even if they aren't, do think that they're fundamentally good. And so I, I, that's what I'm going to tell my stories about. And those are the stories I loved reading. And I'm sure there are lots of options for people. You can have variety. That's what's wonderful about books. They're not all the same. Um, but when you come to my books, I, I like people that I would want to hang out with. And I want to write about people that I would want to hang out with. And that's what you're going to find. Uh, you can come get one of these if you want. OK, Ooh, your hand went up really fast. Go ahead. Yes. 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 Yes, good question. Yes. Will you hand one to this guy right here? Um, so, um, uh, the next Mistborn trilogy. Um, so, I did tell Tor I'll do two more Wax and Wayne books for them. Um, the, we had a big, long conversation, though, and really we feel we need to do Stormlight 3 before I go back to that. Um, because the wait was so long between 1 and 2 that, um, that we, need to, we need to move this along. So um, the next book I'm going to write is going to be, um, going to be The Sequel Arithmetist. And I'll do that this summer. Um, and then after that, I'm going to go into Stormlight 3. And I'm going to write that um, with a goal of having that out next year sometime. Probably late next year, but next year sometime. Um, and so that the wait is not three and a half years now. I think I need, we need to strike before it becomes a habit to release Stormlight books every four years, um, which is a bad habit to be in. Um, uh, and that's sad because I have about a third of the new Wax and Wayne book written. Um, so it'll be pretty fast once I write it. But I really feel like we need to, that Tom Doherty is right, we need to do this next. Let me check the time here. <coughs> 7.40. Okay, so let's do one. Okay. So let's do one more question. Oh, everybody. Oh, everybody wants one. Oh, you, you, you don't know her? 
Well, no. We just met today. No, we just met today. You just met, even though you're wearing the same shirt? No. Okay. All right. All right. We're going to go with this guy because he's, when did you get here? I'm just curious. Uh, about 1.32. One thirty or 2. Yeah, they said the first row had been here for a long time. So I'm going to pick the first row, but when you come through the line, you may ask your question. Well, I can wait and ask a question to that if you want, if you want someone else want to ask a question. Okay, okay. He's going to ask his question. He's deferring in, in favor of you. So your hand went up first. Go ahead in the back. The dude right there. Yeah. Uh, I'm not really writing for this as well, but you could choose one of the most you see on the big screen. If I could choose one of my books to be seen on the big screen, what would I choose? I would choose Mistborn. Um, definitely choose Mistborn. Um, the reasoning for this is I don't think Way of Kings um, would adapt to a, to a, a movie. Um, yeah, maybe a television show. Who knows? Um, but it just won't adapt. Mistborn would adapt. Mistborn would adapt really well, I feel. And so, um, so those who are out there, I'll, I guess I'm in. I'm kind of close to Hollywood. We're not there, but, you know, we're close enough that we can smell it. Um, if, you're, if your uncle is J.J. Abrams, um, uh, <laughs> or, or Joss Whedon, um, you know, uh, go, go tell Uncle Joss, Hey, Joss, I know you're having fun with the Avengers, but you know what else is cool? Mistborn! <laughs> um, and so, yeah, um, I, would, I would really like to see that. And I'm trying hard. Um, for those who don't know, the, the option lapsed. Um, and I posted on my website, and so we are, I, I met with some producers before I came here today, um, and I'm meeting with others, and I'm going to try and pick someone who I really feel can actually get the thing made. So, you can come up and get one of these things. I am going to do a reading. Oh, yes, thank you. So, oh, yay, clapping for the, the, the Q&A being over. Everyone's so excited. No, you're not. <laughs> You know what? I promise. I just promised the last one. I'll have to look in my bag and see if I if I have any more. Um, but yeah. Um, so I think the thing. Let's see. What am I gonna read? We'll open up Dropbox and see what's um, see what's striking at me. I did start writing on a new novella, just like right after I finished um, Firefight. Um, which is a sequel to Steelheart, which is done. Um, yay! Um, after I finished that, I started just writing a little novella. I didn't finish it, but I got a few pages in um, just to try out something I've been thinking about doing for a while. So I think we are going to go ahead and read that, if I can figure where I stuck that. There it is. Yeah, it's right there. Okay. So, um, so this is based off of one of the... the very cool ideas I've had for a magic system for a long time, um, in which magic is granted by um, bacteria and viruses. You catch, a, you catch a disease, and the disease has evolved to give you a magical talent for a short time while you have the disease, in order to kind of keep you alive and encourage you to spread the disease. Um, and then when you get over the cold or whatever you've gotten, you lose that power. Um, which, I, which is a really cool idea to me. Um, and the idea of what you would do with that and what culture the society would do with that. So, I am going to go ahead and I'm going to read that. Iliel was awakened by the whispering of the dead child who followed him. Death and die, death and die. The girl's words were often gibberish, though usually he could make out a few of them. Tonight, what she said, felt eerie, made the whispering in the, in the, oh, sorry, I lost myself. It made the whispering in the darkness send a shiver up his spine. Ilyel sat up in his cot, realizing that he'd fallen asleep in his uniform again and looked across the darkened room, seeking out the child. There, she hid in the shadows by the wooden bin that held his canes. Small, maybe four years old, she had long, straight blonde hair that hung down by her face, ears peeking out like rocks in the sand. She met his eyes. Death and die. She whispered. It would be nice when this particular echo passed. Ilya rose, tugging at his rumpled jacket. Still enough a soldier to feel ashamed at its state. His father would have had Ilya's head if he'd seen such a uniform. Climbing from the bed, Ilya took the cane from beside it for support, then walked out onto the balcony. He put his back to the dead child. She was a figment, an echo, or a side effect from an incubation he'd done a few years back. It was so long ago that he was losing hope that the echo would, ever, would fade. He might be stuck with this hallucination for good. 
He stepped out onto the balcony, using the cane by habit, though he was currently strong enough that he didn't need it to walk. He was recovering from his incubation two months back, the grind of that one having finally worn off. In fact, he was probably too strong. He'd been getting too much sleep lately. He'd been eating too well. He needed to maintain a certain level of physical weakness so he'd be open to incubations, assuming he wanted to remain effective in his duties. And he did want to remain effective, for his own reasons, if not for the core itself. Outside on the balcony, the sky burned. It smoldered high above, deep red lines, the color, the color of a serpent's tongue, glowing like ribs in the, rips in the air. The magma cast a warm red light across the city of Suimak. As always, the air smelled faintly of smoke, so he only noticed it when he was first stepping out of the building into the open air. He knew, logically, that the burning place he saw above was actually the ground. He knew that Suimak flew in the air, eh? City reversed, one of the few bastions of life left in the burning land. Ilyel was, was the one who was upside down, as were all the city's inhabitants. It didn't feel that way to him. He lived here too long. Upward toward the burning ground, upward was toward the burning ground of the land. Downward was toward the su sky and the sun. Things he never saw except on the rare, rare occasion when he was called upon to visit the farms and orchards that grew on the city's sunward side. Ilyel took, stood for a time holding to the cast iron railing, staring up at swaths of burning ground high above, molten rivers, a land destroyed. A warning flag raised to them all. Omnipresent, undeniable, the city itself slept beneath the scarlet glare, glare bathed in red, sleeping. Death and die, the girl whispered from behind. She crawled into the balcony doorway, now crouched there, looking up at the air. Ilil glanced at her. Kareen's gaze, you're a creepy one, he whispered. What must I do to be, to be rid of you? Death and die, she whispered. He tapped his finger on the railing, then strode back into his quarters, splashed some water on his face, and checked the sword blade of his walking cane. Seconds later, he was out the door. Two. The officers of the Corps didn't look like a police station should. And police stations were supposed to be box-like things, stable and functional, designed to indicate to all who visited that this was not a place where nonsense was permitted. Those ornamented co columns, etched with the silver serpents of Mok Lore, those golden doors, those soldiers with ridiculous feathered helms, those were not the symbols of efficient law-keeping. They were quite the opposite. The yell walked up the steps and past the guards, who were at least armed with functional halberds and two flintlock pistols at their belts. They saluted him by lifting fists to their sides. As an incubator, he outranked everyone in this building except the ones who actually mattered. The yell fell a moment of lightheadedness at the top of the steps and was forced to stop, gripping the railing and leaning on his cane. So he wasn't completely well. Good. Neither god stepped to help him. Weakness was expected of incubators, one of the marks of their station. And being near them at the wrong time could be dangerous. One needed only look upward at the burning land to remain, be reminded of how dangerous. With his head cleared, he continued up the steps, cane clicking, and passed the men without returning their salute. He stopped just inside the building, however, coming alert. Motion. Lesser watchmen called him to one another in the large room, aides carrying stacks of paper. <clears throat> Red and eyes and yawns accompanied both groups. Many of these people had been called up unexpectedly despite the early hour. Ill yell? A woman rushed up to him through the bustle. Kuo wore the yellow and blue uniform of an incubator, like his own, but better fitting and far better kept. You look like Ash, man, she said. Are you still on the grind? Ilya looked at, back at the hall, noticing the motion of bodies. Nobody was, was going into the weapons locker, though the riot gear had been set out on the, at the side. Large metal shields and large swords coated in rubber from the trees on the sunward side. They were getting ready for something, but he didn't know what. A prophecy, he guessed. I still can't believe they called you up, Kua said. You deserve some relaxation after. I will visit, visit Patsipa, Ilya said, striding through the room, leaving Kua behind. He tried not to let himself get carried away in the chaos. The event he'd been waiting for would come eventually, but this might not be it. Patsipa made prophecies with some frequency. That was why the Corps maintained her and why she, was car why she carried her terrible burden. It was difficult not to feel tense, however, in the room's frenzy. Nearby, a scribe turned and accidentally knocked over an hourglass, smashing it to the floor, spraying sand across it. He spared it a glance. Sand always drew his attention, but otherwise ignored it, focused on a set of doors at the back of the room. This must have been an alarming prophecy indeed to cause such a fuss. 
The guards here at the doors were even more flowery, with feathers on their shields after an old-fashioned style almost nobody used any longer. The murals might depict men in simple wraps and women in nothing above the waist but necklaces, but those days had long ago passed, centuries before Eliel's times. The Mokpi people were as modern a one as he had ever known. His own brownish tan skin and dark hair blended in well here, well, well enough here, that he could have passed, passed for Mokpi himself, assuming he didn't open his mouth. That was something he'd been better at when he'd been younger. These guards let him pass too, and no scribes or watchmen beset the hallway beyond. Only incubators were allowed in here. Unfortunately, when they, while they presented a more solemn group, it was no less unruly in its own right. Some two dozen of them clumped together at the other end of the darkened hallway like a clot of hair clogging a drain. Yale strode forward, passing doors on either side, set with glass. The small, well-lit rooms showed showed in the glass that they weren't exactly cells, just like the other, their occupants weren't exactly prisoners. They just couldn't leave. With the hallway dark and the rooms lit, each door's window glowed like they looked into other worlds, other worlds inhabited by the sick. It was hard to think of it that way anymore after so long in this land. The people in those rooms weren't simply ill, they were lay incubators. Their job was to live with those, in those little rooms, bearing their afflictions until they started to recover where a ton, another individual, could be brought in to catch their malady and take their place, ensuring that the incubation itself didn't vanish. It was good money, assuming you didn't mind the discomfort, which could range from the snivels to deadly fevers, depending on the incubation you agreed to receive. And of course, there were other benefits. In one room he passed, the occupant, a young man, hovered in the air reading a book. In another, the elderly, an elder woman tapped on a cup, idly changing the color of its liquid inside with each tap. And so he mocked, indeed, Upon this entire land, every disease also granted a special capacity. That ability lasted as long as the ailment did. Many of these blessings were minor, while others were grand. Some few were very, very dangerous, and hence the existence of the incubators themselves. All right, I'm going to stop there. So if you couldn't tell from the rough start, um, this, is a, this is a rough draft. It's a first draft. Oftentimes in my first drafts, what I'm trying to do is kind of lay down the world and the character for myself. And then there'll be some very careful trimming as I move forward. Um, but hopefully someday I'll actually be able to finish that story. It was really cool to write like five pages of it, uh, which I just read to you. Um, um, I have it outlined, but time is tight. So we are going to move on to the signing portion, but I have a few things I want to announce first. And the first one is, um, I don't mind if people want pictures. Uh, pictures are awesome. Um, you don't have to take one. Um, they, they, they take some time. So to speed them up, I'm going to ask for you to hand your camera to this woman right here. Yes, are you the, you the camera person? Right here. So hand your camera. Then get in place in front of me, leaning down um, or to the side. And she's going to count to three and take your picture. I'm going to start signing. Um, you'd be surprised at how much time I sit there staring at a camera, and this is probably going to take a number of hours if you haven't been here before. And so if I can speed it up for all of you, I certainly want to do the picture. So while I'm signing, she'll count to three, I'll look up, we'll snap the picture, I'll go back to signing, and then, and then chat with you. So if you're going to do, do that, um, let's do it that way. There'll be someone here for you to give your camera to. Um, the other thing to warn you is, um, we, you gave out around 200 wristbands, you said, um, and so I generally move at about 50 people an hour, okay? So we're looking at four hours for this signing. It probably will go faster. I actually go a little faster than that, but we're at 8 o'clock right now. Um, I would be surprised if we got done before 11. It's possible. Sometimes, you know, we just move along at a fair clip. But if you wanted, if you've got a, low, a higher number, and you wanted to go, say, visit the cafe um, or go to an, a restaurant, what time do you guys lock the Lock, lock the doors here. Eleven. Eleven. So, so as long as you're back, yeah, you may want to check and make sure, but, you know, I can guarantee that I'm not out of here by 9.30. Guarantee, okay? And 10 o'clock is highly unlikely. Um, and so, um, if you want to pop your head back in, if you've got a late number, go to dinner for an hour and a half, pop your head back in at 9.30 and see how we are. You're perfectly welcome to do that, okay? Uh, don't sweat it. I promise I won't be gone before 9.30. Absolutely promise. So you don't have to stress. You've got an hour and a half for dinner, for, for whatever. You could probably even catch a movie uh, if the timing were right, um, and things like that. 
Um, the last thing I want to do is I want to give a round of applause to Barnes & Noble. Um, we are book people. We love books. And I want to thank the bookstore for having us here. It is sometimes cheaper to get your books elsewhere and then bring them in and get them signed, but some of the reasons elsewhere can sell books as cheaply is they don't have to do this. Now granted, she did tell me that Barnes & Noble members got 40% off of this book, um, so it's hard to find it much cheaper than that, um, particularly since you can grab it right from them. So keep in mind that, um, that you can get them very cheaply here too, but at the same time, if you brought your book in from somewhere else, I would encourage you to you know, look around and see if there's anything else here you want. It doesn't have to be one of my books, but something from the cafe. If you do want one of my books, they do, did say they have a few copies of Emperor's Soul left, which is my short novella that, well, that, that won the Hugo. Yeah, um, yeah thank you. Um, it is, um, many people consider it my finest work, so you can find that. They do have the exclusive editions of Steelheart. They have some of the, the backlist of my Wheel of Time books. They have all sorts of fun stuff that you can pick up, even a couple of arithmetists, I heard. Um, and so you can get those, and I'm happy to sign those. Um, three personalizations, first time through the line, and then as many other signatures as you want. So a maximum three. You don't have to get any of them personalized. We are going to post at the line also, so we'll be handing a post-it. Please stick a post-it on each book you want signed, which each, each book you want to name in. And on a hardcover, stick it. Let me show you. Right here. In fact, you can flap your book. Let's see. They'll probably be doing this, but stick it in here. Um, don't stick it on this side because that's where I sign your name. And so then I just have to like move it and stuff. And I suppose I can do that. But anyway, um, thank you guys so much. You're awesome. I'm going to talk to everyone. You can have a question, whatever. Thank you for coming. Just as a reminder, we did start with our member wristbands, which are orange, so we will accommodate all of the members with the orange wristband first, and then the yellows, it starts with M. Letter M is in Mary tonight, just if you're looking at timing and things like that. So if you have a seat, please keep your seat. If you're standing in the back, you're welcome to wander anywhere in the store, and we'll...